Hey there, fishing friends. This is Chris with Chris Does Fish, and today we're starting our second of a two-part series on building and installing my fish finder on my kayak. My first part should be linked this way. Uh, my first part discusses why I wanted to do this, and then we unboxed the actual fish finder that I got and all the features that it has. Today we're going to be doing probably the most fun part, which is building the battery box that powers all of these features. And I can't just start off with all the equipment and whatnot without talking about my motivations. So first and foremost, this battery box has to be sturdy and waterproof. Uh, to me, it does you no good to have something stowed away on a watercraft that can't potentially have something splash on it. That seems like a pretty huge design flaw. Also, electricity and water generally not mixing, not to mention destroying your equipment, but also personally injuring you. So my water, my, my box had to be waterproof and pretty sturdy. I've looked at some different watertight boxes on the market, and while some might be more waterproof than others, um, the durability is what really led that, um, made that decision for me. Uh, secondly, I wanted my box to be relatively future-proof. Uh, this is not the cheapest build, and I wanted the ability to add on or do something different without having to rebuild the battery box. Things like either adding a larger uh, fish finder in the potential future, but more likely doing something like a live well in the back of my kayak that would draw power from both a motor and an aerator would be something that I'd be interested in doing, especially maybe in the winter when things get a little more tough. So. I didn't. I want the ability to do both, have the fish finder and the live well running at the same time. So I wanted something pretty beefy, have multiple outlets and multiple plugs, and be relatively future proof. Um, this build, just FYI, it ran the battery box itself runs about 150 to even up to 200 dollars, depending on what kind of parts and whatnot that you use. And it sounds kind of pricey if you're using just a really simple kai, uh, a really simple fish finder. But if you're using a more expensive fish finder, that might not be uh, that big of a, an expense. So I didn't want to spend $150 to $200 only to, in a year, have to do it again when I could have done it right the first time. So future-proof, waterproof, and uh, sturdy. Those are my three motivations here. And I think I've come up with a pretty good set of options. So let's go through the equipment. First and foremost is the uh, box itself. As I showed you in the first box, in the first video, I went with a Pelican box. This is the Pelican 1200. It is sturdy as all get out. It's waterproof, crush proof, um, all sorts of different proofs. Uh, it's pretty much the standard on the market. Uh, I didn't really need much bigger of a box than the 1200. And you'll, I think we'll see that everything fits pretty neatly and tightly in this box. But this box is what I consider to be uh, the kind of the gold standard as far as cases go. I can put this in my kayak and not worry about how, uh, how everything's going to fit. Now you might notice all this silver stuff on here. This is me planning out the actual uh, design of the plugs and whatnot. We'll go through them here in just a second. But this is just to kind of show where the plugs are all going to go. Uh, I guess the next thing after the case, if we're talking about battery boxes, is the actual battery. Now, with my particular uh, with my particular box or my particular fish finder, I've heard that anywhere between a seven and a nine amp hour battery will work just fine on the four inch screens, which is probably true. Now, what again talking about this whole future proofing thing? If I went with a larger battery, or excuse me, if I went with a larger fish finder. I've heard that the, the seven and the nine amp hours just simply don't cut it with a five or even a seven, especially a seven inch fish finder. And also with a live well using a pump and maybe an aerator that would draw even more power. So I went with a 12 volt, 12 amp hour battery. This is an expert, uh, expert power, 12 volt, 12 amp hour battery. Uh, the only difference between a 12 volt and a nine volt battery is the thickness. They're the same length and height just the thickness, uh, the, the, 12 volt, the 12 amp hour is uh, wider. So when I found that it would fit neatly in my Pelican case, I said, why not? It was actually the same price, the 12 amp hour and the nine amp hour were the same price on uh, the Amazon. So it was kind of a no brainer to go with a 12 amp hour. This should last 
the four inch screen all day and I can more than likely run the fish finder all day and the um, and a live well pretty much all day without any sort of problem. So that's the battery. Go ahead and put this aside. The next thing I want to do is to keep this thing charged. I never really wanted to open the case up if I didn't have to. And to do that, I used what's called a battery tender. And what's, what they make this is called battery tender, and this is eight, it's an 800 model, which means it plugs in 800 milliamps. Um, it's an 800 milliamp uh, charge. So this little guy will keep my battery charged. I can plug it in, and that's what we'll see is I'm actually gonna have not only outlets, but inlets that I can plug from the wall to my box to keep my battery charged. So I don't even have to open it then. Potentially I could even hook up something like a solar panel if I was going on a multi-day trip. So this little guy will charge my battery, keep it charged and healthy so that I don't have to worry about that. And it's actually gonna be mounted inside the battery box. So that's a handy part. One of the plugs for that is just a simple uh, three plug outlet, it's a waterproof casing. Um, it's a 15 amp power inlet, although it doesn't use nearly that much. So this is gonna be the plug that's exposed on the outside, I hope the glare's not too bad. But uh, this is gonna be the plug on the outside that lets me plug an extension cord from the wall into my box and charge. Uh, a couple other things that you're gonna need, uh, you're gonna need some amp, you're gonna need some fuses. These are marine rated fuses by Marine Power. It comes with a 20 amp fuse, although I am not gonna use a 20 amp fuse, it's way too much power. As we saw in the first video, the actual fish finder only uses three amps. So I traded this out with a five amp fuse and I actually marked it, uh, I marked it on here. We'll be able to see it a little bit closer later. But uh, I marked these with five amp fuses, so that's much more reasonable as far as an amperage for these. Uh, I needed a couple of them because you just want to be sure that you put a fuse on every single plug going from the battery so that nothing crazy happens. So I've got a couple of these fuses. Uh, there was actually one that's in line with the battery tender that will go with that. Um, also what things you're going to need, just some basic red and black cord. Everything that I'm using only uses two cords or only uses two, two wires, a red and a black wire. I'm not doing a bunch of grounded stuff. Most of this just doesn't use that. So I'm using red and black wire, just some basic stuff. This is 14 gauge uh, wire. Then the plugs, the actual plugs itself that's gonna power my fish finder and a potentially a live well or anything else. I wanted something that was secure and that locked in place. So I found these Marinko troller, moding, or troller motor plugs and receptacles. Now what's nice about these is that they actually twist lock in place. So I'll actually take the plug out and this is what the plug looks like. So this is the receptacle. Uh, it's got a nice tight seal when it's not open, when not in use. And what's cool about this is that you put the plug in and you actually, it's got an O-ring on the plug itself. And then when you push it in, you twist it to lock it in place. So if anything jostles it, it's not going anywhere, which is super handy. And these are a little more pricey, but again, that future-proof security thing that I was talking about, I didn't want anything to potentially damage these plugs. So it's a little bit overkill, but that's what I went with. Um, I just already attached a red and a black wire just so that way it was done um, in here. They're really easy to do. I'll show you all in a little bit. Uh, let's see, a couple things. So I had two of those. The last thing that's going to be on the outside, I shouldn't say the last thing, but uh, one of the, the major things that's going to be on the outside is a voltmeter. So I want it to be able to check my battery itself. So this I found online, it's actually a dual USB. So if I wanted to charge GoPro cameras or anything else that's USB powered, which is basically everything small nowadays, I can plug in two 5 amp USB or 5 volt USBs into this but then actually on this little center panel is a voltmeter. Now it's not lit so you can't see it, but what's really nice is that when it's not in, when it's in use but the USBs aren't on, it'll give me a reading of that, of the voltage left in my battery, which is really handy. And because I don't want all of these things on all the time, controlling 
are draining ba uh, draining power from my battery, uh, especially things like the USB and the voltmeter, and then potentially other switches. I don't want them just draining power randomly from my battery when they're not in use. I got switches to go on each of the plugs, and then the voltmeter is gonna have three switches. So there'll be a switch on the voltmeter, there'll be a switch on each of the two uh, trolling motor plugs. And this was just a simple purchase on Amazon. They came in a four pack and each one has a different color LED. So I can tell what's on when it's on, the LED lights up. And when it's off, it's not. But again, this way I can turn the switch on, check the voltage on the battery, turn the switch off, and now it's no longer draining power from my battery. This is a really easy setup and I'm really happy with it. Uh, a couple other minor things that we're gonna need. Uh, I'm gonna use some industrial Velcro to attach the battery box to the kayak. So that way I can easily pull it off, but this is industrial strength, so it's really not, uh, it'll hold the weight of the battery box from any sloshing or anything like that. So I have some industrial Velcro for attaching the box to the kayak. And then you're just gonna need some small electrical appliances, or small electrical tools. And then obviously goop, we have our marine goop. So this is just the silicone adhesive. We use this to watertight seal our different fittings to the box, all sorts of different things like that. We're gonna actually glue the battery in place so that it doesn't jostle around, um, that kind of stuff. And that's what the goop is gonna be for. Otherwise, some basic electrical tools. Um, this is a uh, wire cutter, wire stripper, just a general electrical pair of pliers, kind of everything that I could ever use. I think I got it with my toolbox that I got, it came with it, and I just use this for everything now. Then a couple other little things. These are, uh, these are heat shrink solder butts. Thanks bud. <laughs> these are heat shrink solder butts. So basically you put two wires together, you heat it up and it creates a low temperature solder between the two wires so they aren't going anywhere. And then the heat shrink actually seals it. So it makes a waterproof fitting got these on Amazon, um, yeah, all different sizes, just kind of a test, bo uh, test box, that's all I'm gonna need. Uh, then you're gonna need a couple of paddle connectors, so these are mostly for the battery, and then the little connecting ports, so these are kind of handy. And then, because I want everything to be nice and waterproof and kind of look good, I got some heat shrink, they're different, two different sizes of heat shrink, just to seal around the different wires. And then for the heat shrink, can't go without either just a simple flame from a lighter. This is the cheap option. Or if you're gonna be doing a lot of this, the easy option is just to get a heat tool. It doesn't have to be anything big. This I got on the Zon for like 10, $15. It's pretty cheap. And it's not a high end heat tool. It only does I think 300 watts, which is pretty low. It's also not adjustable, like some of the more industrial heat guns are gonna put on low, medium, or high. Although high apparently is way too high for most of these applications. But this heat tool will melt shrink wrap and do all that sort of stuff for me, which is all I need. So this is a great option if you are gonna be doing a few electrical projects or things like that, cheap heat gun, that'll work. All right, so that's all the parts we needed. It was a fair bit. Uh, doing a bit of research to figure out what all I needed. So without much else to do, I will go pull up for you a schematic of what we're doing. We'll talk about the exact schematic and then we're gonna head out to the garage and actually start drilling into this box. So that'll be exciting. Stay tuned. All right, so this is a quick look at my diagram for this build. Now it's, I'm not an engineer or you know an architect or anything, so this could be terribly wrong and not designed right. Well, it's probably designed, it's designed right. It just might not be drawn correctly. So bear with me here. Let me go through the basic steps. So here is the first, this is the inlet. You can see it's a three prong switch, uh, which will go to the wall. That goes to a battery tender. That's the 800 milliamp battery tender, which has a seven and, or a 7.5 amp fuse. That's what came with the battery tender. So I feel like it's appropriate and I'm not gonna mess with it. So that seven and a half amp fuse then goes to the battery. This battery then splits off into two places. The first, I guess we could go to the USB. So the first, the positive and the negative come this way. There is a fuse, this five amp fuse goes to a switch, 
which goes to the two USB and the voltmeter. So this is on its own loop. The voltmeter is on its own loop that goes to the battery. Then the two switch plugs, the two live well and the fish finder, um, the two trolling motor plugs are on a different fuse. So we can see this line going here to the fuses. And then after the five amp fuse, it, um, it splits and goes to two different switches which control the plugs here for one being the fish finder and the other being the live well. The logic behind this is that I want the fuses to trip if anything goes too awry, so I want multiple fuses here. And then um, eventually, if I'm running a live well and the fish finder, I'm gonna have to switch out this fuse right here, this five amp fuse, with something a little bit larger because the fish finder runs three amp and the live well will probably push something similar, two to three to four amps, depending on what is connected to that. Um, with that said, I can easily switch that fuse out. It's just a, uh, a, a pin style where it clips in. So that's an easy fuse to switch out. Um, but with this system, I feel like I can charge it and I'm, I don't really see a point at which I'm gonna be charging with the battery tender and using the devices at the same time, which could potentially be a problem because then it would be a continuous loop and you could run it off the wall. But I don't think that's one right, correct in any way, and I don't see a reason why I would be doing that. So uh, these two will essentially be on at different times, which is fine. Um, so this is the basic outline of what I'm gonna be doing. So let's go to the garage and get that done. Hey guys, so now we're out here on, on my truck bed. Hopefully the noise on the outside's not too, too bad. But um, I'm gonna be drilling my Pelican case. So you can see I've got a couple holes. I've got uh, the spots marked out for our different places. And the first thing I wanna do is drill the holes for the actual outlets and the switches to go. So you'll see the silver, this is actually where the, the outline of the outlet, but there's some small circles and you probably can't see them. You definitely can't see them from here. This is where I'm actually gonna drill the holes because we'll have, for example, this rectangle fits over here but I only need to drill the hole for this right here. Um, what I've, you can notice that I've already done is cut out the rib, uh, the molding material that's right here just so that it fits flush. I used my Dremel for this. It was really easy. I just used the um, coarse cutter and then I used the wire blade or the wire brush to uh, get down anything left. I still want it coarse because I want some silicone to be able to attach to it. So. I'm gonna put this in quick motion so that way I'm gonna speed this up so that you can see me cut all these holes real quick.
All right, so that was getting a little repetitive, but you can kind of get the idea. So I have, let me adjust this for you. So now I've drilled a hole for each of the three switches, the two plugs, the uh, voltmeter, and the actual, uh, and the input. Now I used the Dremel, the wire brush to widen out this hole, it was working really well. I actually kind of wore out the bit entirely, so I'll just throw that away. But now, what I'm gonna do is use just some regular old sandpaper, this is 220 grit, and manually smooth this out. The one thing you don't want in here are any burrs. So if you have uh, this plastic and things like that coming off, that's going to uh, basically prevent the watertight seal from forming, and that's what we don't want. So just use some standard sandpaper and just go right along the edges and take off any sort of uh, burrs that are along the edges and just smooth things out. Um, it's faster than with the Dremel. The Dremel probably would do it faster, but less precise. And really right now, this is just a quick job. So I'll see you here in a second. All right, guys. So I've got everything sanded down. There are no burrs or anything. And I've got, um, I used a little bit of just some regular nail polish remover to remove any of the, one, just a little bit of paint, and then also clean the area up of any dust. So now that it's dry, I can go ahead and attach my pieces. Now, for some, like for example, this outlet right here. Uh, this outlet has a nice handy uh, O-ring that goes on the underside. So the plug will go, will go through. I'm assuming you can see that here and then the o-ring will screw in from this side underneath what makes that nice is then i don't have to worry about uh, tightening it down too much because it'll pretty much take care of that and then i can just use the screws that are included as a backup now others like this guy right here this is my this is my socket it does not come with a an a ring on the inside so I'm gonna have to essentially screw it down and then use something heavy to press down on it to get the silicone to nice and seal tight. Fortunately, I have something in the form of the actual battery that I'm gonna use, which is probably um, eight pounds, 10 pounds, it's heavy. Uh, this thing is pretty darn heavy. So I'm gonna glue both of these sockets down and then weigh it down with the actual battery overnight. So. Without further ado, I'm just gonna get started with that and uh, let y'all follow along. Well, we're back in my living room again. And what you can see is it's been 24 hours. We have all of the connectors, all of the plugs and switches glued in place, screwed in place so that we are good to go on the inside. You can see this is the plug where we're gonna charge. These are our two trolling motor plugs that are successfully glued in place here. And this is our voltmeter. And this one right here is our voltmeter slash USB plugs. Now each of the plugs is on a switch. So I can turn the switches on and off to provide power to those when I need. And so that way they don't drain power when I don't. This is a really good plug. There we go, that's not going anywhere. Which is probably a good design flaw, or not a design flaw, it's probably good. Okay, so on the inside, this is where things get a little scary for some people. It's not really that bad. What you can see is that the switch is just next to each of the plugs that they connect to. Now, when we compare it to an existing switch, we can see where the LED sign is. The plug next to that, that's actually the red wire. So for example, this one and then the two tops are the uh, are the LED are the red. So the red wire connects to this plug, this uh, connection right here, and then the top plug. So this connection and that connection go the red wires. Then from the larger post here, that's where the black wire goes to the actual outlet. So this one, this one, and that one, and then the smaller post next that hasn't been used essentially is what's gonna to go to our fuse and then from the fuse to the battery. The way I'm gonna do this is work 
in towards the, the battery itself. So I'm gonna start on the outside here, and then from the outside, I'm gonna work my way from the plug to the switch, the switch to the fuse, and then from the once I have the fuses all connected, that's when I'm going to actually glue the battery in place and connect the things to the battery. That's kind of the last step. So without further ado, I will get started. Feel free to watch in. I'm gonna to try to probably speed this up a little bit just so that it doesn't take as long to watch as it does to actually do. I almost forgot to add a, a couple other things that we're going to use. I have my heat gun that is plugged in for melting or shrinking some various lengths of shrink wrap and then some, these are cold or I should say warm solders and shrink wrap. So if I need to connect actual wires, I can do that here. Um, there is a, I have a lighter just in case. And then I have the fuses, I have two fuses here and I have my paddle style connectors and then just some red and black wire sitting by with my electrical cutter, stripper, every multi-tool, my electrical multi-tool. So these are the tools that I'm gonna be needing. And uh, yeah, so I'll just be pulling from here, working in the box and then going as needed.
All right, so now we have managed to wire together everything and you can see here, uh, this is pretty much the finished product as far as wiring goes. And what you'll notice is that it kind of looks like a jungle, which is fair, it does. It's a jungle right now. Um, I did want to check and make sure that it actually worked. So I hooked up the connectors to the battery and I'll turn this around for you without disconnecting the battery. And you can see when I turn the switch on, the voltmeter lights up. It doesn't have a ton of juice in it right now, but it's reading 13 volts. So, hey, looky there. We're working. Handy dandy. Almost like I knew what I was doing. All right, so now that we know this works and I don't have to redo anything, I'm gonna go ahead and disconnect the battery and put in uh, the protectors again. So now what we're gonna do is just put this aside. Uh, so now what I'm gonna do is a little bit of cable management. I've got some little mini zip ties and then I picked up a whole bunch of these little squares. These squares will stick to the sides of the box and connect and then I can put the zip ties through it. And this will hold the zip ties, or this will hold the cables flush up against the wall. So I'm gonna try to run these cables as flush against the wall as possible. And then once all that's done, I will glue in the battery tender. And once that is done, then I will actually glue the battery in. So everything's summed together pretty well. And I'm gonna put you back into quick speed so you can see me do all this. All right, and well, that's it for the bulk of the install. I've got the battery itself glued into the bottom of the case. I put a little bit of foam just to keep that in place for now. The foams are the goop is gonna set in 24 hours, just like the battery tender and everything else. So tomorrow when I get home from work, I can just shore this up and things will be good to go. But just for now, I just wanna show you, I've got the uh, I've got the battery tender, I've got everything plugged in, and uh, what's really nice is all this now just closes in, and it's a nice ah, tight seal. I don't want to move it too much because things are still gluing, and if I start rattling it around, then, you know, things are going to move. So now, everything is nice and sealed up. Again, everything's still working. Not sure if you can see that, but I've got the voltmeter still running until I turn the power off. It's pretty handy. Uh, the one thing I am gonna check is the actual plug itself. So I'm gonna go check that real quick. 
All right, so I just want to kind of show you how this would work. Here's the extension cord. It's connected to the wall. It just plugs right in to this connection right here. On the other side, that goes here to the battery tender. We can see if I hold this up, nope, not this way, if I don't beat the camera up first. So you can see now this little guy is beeping and what that shows is that the battery is fairly charged but it's going to be adding, uh, it's still juicing up the battery. So like I said, what this means is that once I seal this case closed, I never have to open it again, which is really nice. So it'll be completely waterproof all the way through. Theoretically, I could even charge this thing in the rain, which is pretty cool. Um, so I don't need to fully charge the battery right now. Um, all I really need to do is close it up for a night. Actually, I'm not even gonna close it. I'm just gonna let the uh, goop cure and dry. So 24 hours, we'll be good to go. Thanks. All right, so it has been a long journey, but I think we finally got to the point where we can call this build finished. I'm gonna go ahead and open it up and show you the inside. So here you go. We've got all the wiring in place. We have the cords routed to the tender and tried to route as much as we could to keep them out of the way. I have some foam glued in place. That was probably the last thing I didn't show you. I just cut some foam and put it pretty thick around the battery so that there would be nothing to keep the battery from sliding even though it's uh, glued in place. So just in case the glue gave out, there's foam that's gonna keep it from jostling, which will also help keep the glue from coming out. Everything is in place. Everything is attached via zip tie and these little tab squares. Really the last thing to do before I close it up for good is add a couple little things to help protect it for a little bit longer. Uh, on the internet, on the Amazon, you can get these guys right here. These are Z-Rust Plast Tabs. This is what the Flambo boxes have. Uh, they just color them blue. Essentially, they release a vapor that coats all the metal and prevents rusting and other damage. Not quite sure how that works, but you know what? We're just gonna trust it. Uh, they last, it says they last for two years and they protect a radius of up to seven inches, a radius of seven inches. So this one tab is more than enough for this little container right here. And then the last thing I'm gonna add, I picked up these to protect my tackle as well. These are little desiccant bags. They come in all of your major electronics that you get and they're just a silica powder. They absorb moisture out of the water or out of the air, I should say. They absorb water out of the air. Uh, they're really cheap. I want to say this whole bag of one gram 50 pack was maybe five or seven dollars. So they're very cheap, very inexpensive, but I'm just going to add three, well, let's call it four or five. Why not? It doesn't really matter how many we add. We just want to add enough that it's going to absorb any sort of humidity in the container and prevent rust and corrosion from hitting at any of the electronics, although they're all shrink wrapped and water sealed and whatnot. But this is just to help the electronics and the battery last as long as humanly possible. With that said, I'm just gonna give it one final closing. It's a pretty tight seal. Yeah. With the foam up against the battery, it's a real tight seal. So let's just go ahead and look at the final product. This is the outside. We've got the plug for our charging port here. This is a three prong a grounded outlet. So any extension cord can go into this right here and charge our battery. It's a nice tight seal when we're not using it. Then these two plugs are, <laughs> these two plugs are both uh, locking trolling motor plugs. I'm gonna use this one of them for my fish finder and one of them for my uh, fish, or I should say my live well when eventually I do that. They're both controlled by a plug, so when the switch is turned on, um, this will then be on, and so, but otherwise we're gonna leave them off. And then finally, I have a voltmeter, which right now the battery is fully charged. And this also, this voltmeter doubles as a USB, or a dual USB plug, so I can charge all sorts of other things that I need. But then again, turn it off when I'm not using it. All right, so that really concludes this video. 
This was the second of what I assume is a three-part mini-series on building my ultimate fish finder battery box and installing it on my kayak. Coming up next, if you haven't seen the first part, you might want to see the first part where I break down or I unbox the fish finder because we're going to be using that in my next episode where I install the battery box, put the fish finder on the kayak and get everything up and running. Um, if you like this video, give it a like, a thumbs up. Um, if you want to see more stuff like this, I'm going to be doing a lot of additions to my kayak in this off season before spring and summer really hit. Um, hit that subscribe button so you can see more content like this in the future. But until then, thanks for signing in my fishing friends and tight lines.